Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Jason Lepoyarvi. I'm a former president of the Oxford University C.S. Lewis Society. I am also very interested in the other members of the Inklings, including Tolkien. In this lecture, I want to talk about J.R.R. Tolkien and his views on women and his relationships on women with women. What did Tolkien believe about women's higher education? What did he believe about friendship love between the sexes, between women and men? Did any of his own relationships with women rise to the level of friendship proper? Ironically symptomatic of the lack of attention these questions has received is um, a recent book, a very good book called Perilous and Fair, Women in, in the Works and Life of J.R.R. Tolkien. But what's ironic about this is that 13 of the 14 essays or so focus exclusively on J.R.R. Tolkien's works and only one focuses on his life. So given the title, Women in the Works and Life of Tolkien, this is fairly misleading and potentially perilous too. Why so? Well, it's because extracting a person's, an author's personal views from fiction alone is never advisable. Gleaning biography from fiction is not advisable because there's a high risk that you will read into your sources opinions that the author may not actually have endorsed. And so it's the eisegetical mistake. mistake. And this is very important for Tolkien studies and perhaps, perhaps even more so for C.S. Lewis. In a letter that we will revisit later, Tolkien describes women as companions in shipwreck, not guiding stars. Our focus will be on nonfiction for the dangers pertaining to um, the dangers that I just mentioned. Tolkien's interactions with women could be group, grouped playfully into four Fs, family, fandom, and philology, and possibly friendship. We will see. The book I mentioned included one essay on Tolkien's life, and that is a very well-researched essay by John Ratliff called The Missing Women, Tolkien's Lifelong Support of Women's Higher Education. Now, in this essay, Ratliff critiques Tolkien, um, critiques a caricature of Tolkien as a man who, by choice, spent most of his time, most of his life in exclusively male company. And so Ratliff reminds the reader of the many female influences Tolkien had, starting from a very young age. He was orphaned a very young. He lost his father soon after birth. He was still a very young boy and his mother at the age of Eight, I believe. His mother, Mabel Tolkien, born 1870 and died 1904, so died very young, taught the boys, taught Tolkien, his, his brother, Hilary, to read by the age of four and to write soon after. She tutored them in Latin, in French, in um, German, and in botany, as one does. Tolkien's Greater family included five aunts, so more female influences in his life. And he would regularly spend time with these aunts. Uh, he would share private languages with his and stage plays with his two cousins, Mary and Marjorie. One of Tolkien's aunt, Aunt Jane Suffield, taught geometry to the boys. In 1961, Tolkien looks back and, and says, the 
professional ant is a fairly recent development, perhaps, but I was fortunate in having an early example, one of the first women to take a science degree. Jane Suffield started her career as a school teacher and um, ended it, it being Scotland, as a farmer. Tolkien fell in love with another, a fellow lodger, a fellow orphan by the name of Edith Bratt, who was three years his senior. And um, unlike Tolkien, however, she was illegitimate, illegitimate, meaning that um, her father had never recognized her. Um, her mother had been a governess in her father's house. This was very tragic. She had lots of musical talent. She would play the piano and the organ. She had an Anglican background. Later in life, when they married, Edith injured her back while playing the organ and, and never really fully recovered. Tolkien's guardian, however, uh, Father Francis Morgan told Tolkien to break up, break off the dalliance until he turned 21 years old, so he could focus on getting to Oxford. He accepted, uh, not wanting to grieve or to deceive the man who had been a father to me, Tolkien says, more than most fathers. So he broke off communication with Edith for years, and on his 21st birthday, he wrote to her, um, and five days later went back to her and became engaged and informed an astonished family. Baron and Luthien is one of Tolkien's famous stories, and it has actually a historical um, inspiration for one May or June day in Yorkshire, Tolkien and Edith came across a hemlock grove, and under the trees, Edith danced, danced. And this inspired one of the longest and heartfelt tales, the tale of Dinuviel, where a mortal man, Baron, and an immortal elven lady, maiden, Luthien, are, you know, da is dancing under hemlock Umbles. They fall in love and they overcome their sorrow for a while and then they pass beyond death together. Tolkien and Edith had three sons, John, Michael and Christopher, and one daughter, Priscilla. It's easy to see why Tolkien himself would find this male-only accusation misguided. Many people who knew the family and knew him described him as a man surrounded by children, wife, daughter, and grandchildren. Women who spent time with the family agreed, including their several au pairs, who would call him a family man. One former student remembers Tolkien being an unusual um, Dawn for being notably sympathetic to women undergraduates. Unlike Tolkien, I'm sorry, unlike C.S. Lewis, Tolkien was married, so he didn't need a chaperone to tutor women um, privately. So he was able to tutor women in groups and privately, whereas C.S. Lewis only tutored them in groups and only early in his career. And Tolkien was very committed to this task. Ratcliffe writes, Tolkien was unusual for dawns of his era in his support for women taking degrees and pursuing academic careers. Examples abound and the statistics are remarkable. As a tutor, Tolkien associated with himself, especially with the four all-female colleges at the time at Oxford. And nearly half of his advanced degree students were actually women. This is astonishing for his era. Priscilla Tolkien, who went to Lady Margaret Hall, one of the female colleges at Oxford, writes, 
My father believed completely in higher education for girls. Never at any time in my life or since did I feel that any difference was made between me and my brothers, so far as our educational needs and opportunities were concerned. I wa it was, I think, a source of pride and pleasure for him that he had a daughter as well as sons at the university, which was his scholarly and academic home for much of his working life. Of the five women's colleges, later a fifth one was added, in Oxford at the time, Lady Margaret Hall was probably the one he knew best. He spoke with appreciation of his visits to the high table in the days when Miss Greer was principal and Miss Everett was his colleague on the language side of the English faculty. Dining at an Oxford College high table would be by invitation only. It's no coincidence that the J.R.R. Tolkien Professorship of English Literature, which was created in 1981, rotates between um, the former all-female colleges. Hopefully, we've established that Tolkien was a man who, by choice, spent much of his time, his life, in a largely female society. His mother raised him and cared for him. Um, as a boy, he played with his girl cousins. Women tutored him. He tutored women. He fell in love with the woman, remained committed to her to a lifetime, for a lifetime. He raised a daughter into a woman. He corresponded with women. I mentioned mentored women, worked alongside women dined with women, and he even smoked pipes with women, says Priscilla, his daughter. But did he befriend any women? Did any of these relationships rise to the level of friendship proper? That's a very different question. In C.S. Lewis's famous book, The Four Loves, Lewis explains that men and women can be friends, and it is very common when they work side by side and share joint passions and interests. Lewis had several female friends um, and spoke very highly of, of this and welcomed it. What about Tolkien? He looks a little apprehensive. Was Tolkien as optimistic as C.S. Lewis was? Well, in short, on paper, no. In 1941, he wrote a long letter to Michael, his, one of his sons, his second son. And um, Michael was possibly considering marrying at the time. Despite some peculiar points in this letter, I think it's full of pretty wise advice about love and marriage. It's almost a call to arms to take love seriously and to take women. Here is at once egalitarian and responsible. The image is egalitarian and responsible, aimed at the double temptation to either idolize women or patronize women. Now, let me quote from letter um, 43. Some of you own this book, perhaps, and it's on page 48. This is Tolkien speaking to his son. The dislocation of the sex instinct is one of the chief symptoms of the fall. In this fallen world where the friendship that should be pos possible between all human beings is virtually impossible between man and women. The devil is endlessly ingenious and sex is his favorite subject. Later in life, when sex cools down, it may be possible. It may happen between saints. To ordinary folk, it can only rarely occur. The other partner will let him or her down, almost certainly by falling in love. But a young man does not really, as a rule, want friendship, even if he says he does. There are plenty of young men, as a rule. 
He wants love, innocent and yet irresponsible, perhaps. So friendship between men and women is virtually impossible unless you're a senior or a saint. We are quite far from C.S. Lewis's optimism. Did Tolkien live by these beliefs, however? Um, if we comb through his letters, uh, there are very few intimate letters to any women apart from his wife and daughter. And based on this vacuity, this um, silence, and in light of the problematic letter to his son, Michael, we might conclude that Tolkien anticipated and lived by what's called the Billy Graham rule in evangelical circles, which I like to call the Mike Pence maneuver, and avoided intimate correspondence with women um, in fear of falling in love and perhaps creating a sex scandal, just like the absolutist who in fear of intoxication abstains from, wa um, from wine instead of letting the virtues of moderation and charity direct and inform one's wine consumption. Except women are not drinks, they are human persons. However, the letter collection is just a selection. Hundreds of letters were omitted from this collection the collection focuses primarily on Tolkien's works. If we broaden our focus a little from the letter collection to diaries, to memoirs, to oral histories and so on, a rather different image of Tolkien emerges. You see here, he looks much more chill. I said Tolkien's interactions can be grouped into four Fs family, fans, and philologists. Um, I propose that some from these three groups became true friends as well. As for fa uh, female fans, I don't see any evidence that any fan became a true friend. With C.S. Lewis, however, it was different. Lewis ended up even marrying his most persistent fan. How about family? How about Priscilla, for example? Well, perhaps there is a trip to Italy and the diary that Tolkien kept during that trip, which records records that they shared a lot of interests and that that relationship may have been a friendship as well. How about Edith? Um, here, I am more hesitant. Um, I mean, you, it's, it's obvious that she's feigning interest in Tolkien's work, even in this photo. I, that's just a joke. But it is true that they found it difficult to find common interests, which is at the heart of friendship proper as Tolkien and C.S. Lewis understood it. Um, perhaps insofar as they gardened together and felt passionate about their children, they may have been friends. If somebody knows more, I am open to being corrected. I'm also a little bit hesitant about four other women, three former students, um, a sample of women that I'm tempted to call Tolkien's friends, but hesitant. Catherine Farrer, Mary Salu, Helen Buckhurst, and Alvo Kurvinen. Starting with Catherine Farrer. Unfortunately, I don't have photos. She was born in 1911 and died in 1972. She was the wife of the Oxford theologian, Austin Farrer, both friends of C.S. Lewis as well. Notably, her letters are signed to Ronald Tolkien instead of more officially J.R.R. Tolkien. I'm sorry. His letters to her are signed Ronald. That would have been significant at the time. Mary Salu was supervised by Tolkien in the 40s for nine years, which is pretty long for a mere B-lit degree. 
Incidentally, however, she also worked for the professor, compiling indexes and glossaries, which is a task likely to stall anyone's career, even without a war and even without post-war austerity. Helen Buckhurst was a former student of Tolkien, uh, who turned uh, uh, into a co colleague, a fellow at St. Hugh's College. She shared Tolkien's Catholicism, like many um, of their circle of acquaintances and friends did. She was Priscilla's godmother. All of this suggests very warm relations, at least. Are they, were they close friends as well? I'm not sure, but Buckhurst seems to consider Tolkien as, as a close friend. She um, addresses her letters always to Dear Ronald. There's a similar difficulty with Auvo Kurvinen, who was born in 1916 and died in 1979, who I believe was Tolkien's only Finnish student. Despite having a male name, Auvo, she was indeed a woman. She's not very well um, known outside of Finland and barely known inside, um, yet academically one, she was one of Tolkien's two most successful female students. She became a professor of English in Helsinki. So maybe she was the one behind Tolkien's famous invitation to Finland, which he had to cancel. I'm not sure. Full disclosure, I don't think Alvo Kurvinen and Tolkien's were friends. Uh, I just have a, a bias and I wanted to introduce this person. Tolkien never visited Finland, but he did visit several other countries and he visited Belgium at least four times. What drew him back repeatedly? Formally, conferences did. Informally, his dear friend, his dear former student, Professor Simon Dardenne, born in 1899, died in, 18, in 1986. While many of the other relationships that I've been talking about, Tolkien's relationships with his wife and daughter, Farrer, Salu, Buckhurst, and Kurvinen, perhaps, no, not, um, at least approached friendship. His relationship with Dardan, I propose, is the first of three that certainly reached it. Her memoir of Tolkien expresses deep gratitude uh, for a friendship which extended 40 years, she says. And this description is fully warranted. The visible characteristics um, um, of friendship and all the harm hallmarks of friendship love are there. Significant joint interest, uh, reciprocal appreciation and affection, often tangible mutual support and formidable trust on all sides, in effect by shared lives. She lived with the family as an unofficial aunt a few times, a couple times. Priscilla visited her in Belgium. They called each other friends openly. They were on first name basis. And in 1973, Dardan traveled to Tolkien's funeral. The second of the three that I wish to single out is Dorothy Everett. Again, I apologize that I don't have photos. She was born in 1894 and died in 1953. She was the Miss Everett in Priscilla Tolkien's, his daughter's account of the high table dinner invitations. They served together on various boards. They dined together at college. They co-examined students. We know much less about Everett um, than we do of Dardan but Priscilla credits her for something that almost single-handedly lodges her among Tolkien's friends. My father's many years of friendship with Dorothy Everett, the great beauty of Lady Margaret Hall, were the things that led me naturally to choose Lady Margaret Hall. 
I am supping with Elaine and others. Tolkien wrote to his son in April of 1944. Here we meet Elaine Griffiths, the last of the three, and I close with her. She was born in 1909 and died in 1996. So she was almost 20 years, 15 years younger than Tolkien. She too was Catholic. She too had been the, a member of the mixed literary group at Oxford called the Cave, which existed before the Inklings. Griffiths became de facto Tolkien's assistant and she was one of the very few to be allowed to read The Hobbit in manuscript. His dedication to her copy is um, uh, as humorous as it is affectionate. To Elaine, queen of the hobbits, and my very old friend. She was tiny in stature. But one lovely spring day, having just voted for the new professor of poetry, Elaine, who lived alone, invited Tolkien over to her home. They travel in her car together, unchaperoned. Upon arrival, his hostess asks him what he would like to drink. Had he been a, an evangelical, overcautious American pastor, per, perhaps red flaming flags would have gone up. However, Instead, the reckless Catholic layman asks for a double whiskey. But it was May 1973. Tolkien would have been 81 years old, and Griffiths was well over 60. The venerable old man visiting his very old friend was, by that time, a widower, a senior, and quite possibly a saint. As far as we know, Tolkien remained committed and faithful to Edith all his life. Unlike Charles Williams, who, though perhaps carnally faithful, committed moral adultery um, with several women. He had these prolonged flirtations with impressionable young women, as the biographer Raymond Edwards says, or as I like to call it, he was mythologically gallivanting. That was not Tolkien's case. Tolkien's poem about his love with Edith, uh, Tree is one of his favorite images, reminds me of a song in Finnish called Kaksi Puuta, Two Trees, by the artist Juha Tapio. And let me read it. Lo, young we are, and yet have stood like planted hearts in the great sun of love, so long as two fair trees in woodlands or in open dale stand utterly entwined and breathe the airs and suck the very light together, that we have become as one deep-rooted in the soil of life and tangled in sweet growth. Beren and Luthien, Tolkien identified Edith with Luthien. And the story is well worth reading or listening to. There's a beautiful recording of it that you can find easily online uh, of Christopher, their youngest son, reading it. There's a letter that I want to quote from that was written soon after Edith's death. And Tolkien Keen is here speaking to his children. She knew, and knew she knew, uh, I'm sorry, she was, and knew she was, my Luthien. I will say no more now, but I should like, ere long, to have a long talk with you, for it seems probable that I shall never write any ordered biography. It is against my nature which expresses itself about things deepest felt in tales and myths. Someone close to my heart, someone close in my heart to me 
should know something about things that records do not record. The dreadful sufferings of our childhoods from which we rescued one another, but could not wholly heal wounds that later often proved disabling. The sufferings that we endured after our love began, all of which over and above personal weaknesses might help to make pardonable or understandable the lapses and darknesses which at times marred our lives, and to explain how these never touched the depths or dimmed the memories of our youthful love. Forever, especially when alone, we still met in the woodland glade and went hand in hand many times to escape the shadow of imminent death before our last parting. Incredible letter. I love that phrase, things that records do not record. Tolkien and Edith are buried in North um, Oxford, and I've, I have visited the grave site. If this topic interests you more, may I uh, recommend this book, Apprehending Love? Um, it's just, uh, it's, br it's brand new. I have an article in it called Companions in Shipwreck, J.R.R. Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien's Female Friendships. This is the first shift for a dear professor and mentor of mine. And it has 372 pages of research on love. I go into much more detail about Tolkien's relationships in this article. And I talk about the standard that I use to evaluate whether any of his fr friendships or relationships approach or arrive at friendship. Because we need to understand what friendship is in order to evaluate whether we have tasted it.